Hi everyone, it's James here, and in this tutorial we're going to be going through some really basic JavaScript function exercises based on a new platform that I found for completing exercises online. So I think it's great to complete JavaScript exercises no matter what level you're at, it's good for practice. And I found a new platform which I think you're going to really enjoy, and I'm going to be taking you through how the platform works and also going through some example challenges today. So let's take a look at the platform and dive in. So this is the website I was mentioning, it's called Edabit or Edabit, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And it's a really great place to start learning some JavaScript by doing some simple exercises. So you need to go to the Edabit website and actually create an account. Uh, it's a simple process, just adding in your email address, etc., to actually get yourself logged in. Uh, but then if you come over to this first challenge in the challenges section, which is about how the Edabit system works, it'll just give you a brief overview of what you're supposed to be doing. And if you've used Code Wars or even Code Academy before, then this sort of principle should be pretty familiar to you. But essentially, you'll be given some instructions, and then if you go over to the Code tab, you're simply asked to write a simple function, and then when you click the check button, uh, your code will be checked against some tests, uh, and then you'll see the result over here in the right-hand side. And of course, if you don't complete the function, or if you put some output that's not actually quite right for the challenge, then you'll get some uh, kind of failure notice, and you'll see a success notice if you get it correct. Uh, so just going back to the instructions for this introductory challenge, uh, you'll see basically all you're asked to do uh, with this hello function is to return a string uh, saying hello edabit, or edabit. And we can literally just copy that and paste it into the code section. And now when we click the check button, it will rerun the tests and hopefully this time it should come back saying that it's correct and we get a little noise to say that it's correct and you can see that the test has passed. So pretty straightforward, all you need to do is fill in the blanks for the function based off of the instructions. So with that in mind let's go over to the challenges section again and let's actually try to complete some of these challenges. So the tutorials are just set as very easy at the moment, but you can see there's some differing levels of uh, difficulty that you can select from there. Uh, but you can see there's quite a few different challenges even in this section. So we're going to go through some of these now, and what I'm actually going to do is take a very simple approach to start off with to explain the actual principle of the exercise and the simple JavaScript behind it. And then we'll refactor the solutions to make them a little bit more polished and a bit more of a higher level of JavaScript. Uh, so you'll learn a couple of things by doing these exercises today. Okay, so this first one is just to return the sum of two numbers, so a standard JavaScript task. Uh, so we're going to be writing a function where we're taking two numbers and obviously just adding them together. So let's head straight over onto the code section. And you can see we've got our function name set up already, and it's already got the parameters inside of here as well. So we don't need to do any setup work for this. Um, but let's start off by, first of all, adding the two numbers together. So in JavaScript, we can just add two numbers together by using the addition operator. So I'm going to save that into a new variable. So we could use var or let, but for this I'm going to use const because the result of this isn't going to change. And I'm going to create a new variable called result, and then I'm going to add a and b together. And then with that done, if we were to actually check this at the moment, that would still fail because we actually need to return that result from this function. So uh, don't forget the function always needs to return something if it's going to be used elsewhere as it is here. So we're going to return the value that's stored in result, which is the result of our calculation of a and b. So if we actually check that now, what we should find is that we get all of our tests passing when the code runs. And you can see it's done some various calculations and it's checked whether the uh, values that have been put in actually match the expected result. So let's go ahead and refactor this first of all. Uh, so you might think, well, we don't really need to store this intermediate tree result variable because we're not doing anything with it. As soon as we've got the result, we actually return it. So we could just take the calculation of a and b and replace it there and that will work fine. And then we can remove that variable because we're no longer using it. So we can check that again. And everything still passes. But we can go one step further and use some more advanced JavaScript features like the ES6 arrow syntax, for example. Uh, and we could save this into a variable, this function. And we could say uh, we're going to create a new variable called addition, which is basically a function. And then we'll turn that into an arrow function. And because we're using an arrow function and there's only one line of code, we don't actually need this return statement or the curly braces. So we can remove that curly brace there and also the return statement as well and just put that all on one line and then click check again. And when the tests return, you can see they're still all passing. 
So we could leave this function here. There's no problem with it. It seems to be working just fine as it is. So we could add some safeguarding in here as well. So what if the developer that's using this addition function forgets to pass in either A or B, uh, then we'll probably get some weird result coming out of here because one of these results will be undefined. So we can use another ES6 feature, which is default values to actually assign a default value to both of these parameters. So now if the developer that's using the addition function forgets to either put in the first or the second parameter, then that result will just default to zero and the code will run, although it might not be the quite the expected result, we shouldn't get any weird output in our tests. And let's just check one last time to make sure they're still working. And one last time you can see we've got all of our tests passing. So now on the Edibit platform, once you've finished one of the actual challenges and you've got all your tests passing, you can then click the continue button which will then mark that challenge as complete and it will actually then give you a new challenge to look at as well. Uh, but if we just go back to the previous challenge that we were on, uh, the sum of two numbers, I'll just click here again. When you've actually completed one of these challenges, you then unlock the solutions tab. So if we go over there now, you will actually then see a list of other users solutions so that you can compare your own result and see if you can learn anything new about another approach to it. So in this example, this user here has actually done a similar approach to us in returning A and B, but they also put some type checking in to see if the actual parameters that are being passed in are actually indeed of type number. And if they're not, it's actually returning a string saying that there was an error with the parameters. But you can see that there are other users that have taken a simple approach as well and have done very similar solutions to what we just did a moment ago. Okay, so let's go and do some more challenges now. Let's go back to the challenges tab and we'll move on to the next one that we've got in our list, which is to uh, convert minutes into seconds. So if we click on that one. So this challenge is asking us to convert minutes into seconds by writing a function that's basically going to take in a value uh, which is representative of some minutes and just convert it into seconds. So again, nice and easy. I mean, all we really need to do to get uh, minutes into seconds is to multiply it by 60. Uh, in fact, they don't even mention that in the instructions there. So they're assuming that you know that's the uh, case. So let's go on to the uh, code section. And you can see we've got our function already set up for us as well. So we could do something really simple like convert minutes two seconds by multiplying it by 60. And uh, if we check the solution, that should be enough to make all of our tests pass. And as you can see, we get four passing tests in our output. So we could leave it there, but let's just convert it to an arrow function again, just so that we get the hang of how to do that. So we're going to convert our regular function into an arrow function. And again, because we're only returning the value and there's no other lines of code with inside of our function, we can actually remove the curly braces uh, and the return statement as well. And one other thing we can do here as well, we can actually remove the braces, the parentheses from around the minutes argument to the function. Because when you have an arrow function that has only one argument to it, you don't actually need those parentheses. But it's up to you whether you remove them or not, because as you can see, this is starting to look a little bit weird and possibly a little bit difficult to read. Uh, but I'm going to leave it as that for the moment, and then I'm going to submit the final response here. And you can see because I haven't completed this challenge before, I actually level up and get some experience. And you can give some feedback on how difficult you felt this solution was. So let's actually, uh, we can go to the solutions again for this one which you can see the other users that have completed this have got similar results to what we just created there. Nothing wrong with using the function keyword, but you can see there's a lot of people that are using arrow functions as well. Okay, so let's carry on with a few more challenges. Let's go back to the challenges section. And we're going to on to the next one, which is to return the next number from the integer past. And this sounds a little bit complicated because it's talking about integers, which are just whole numbers really. Um, but it's basically saying create a function that takes a number and just adds one to it and returns the result. So it's actually just adding one to a number and then returning that value. So this is really straightforward. And I'm going to do the same thing that I did on the previous exercises. I'm first of all, just going to do a very simple uh, example. So return the number plus one. And you can see all of the tests have passed. And let's just convert that to an arrow function as we did before. So const addition, uh, is equal to the number. I'm removing the actual parentheses from around the arguments. We don't need those. There's only one of them. And then for addition, we're just saying that the result of the function, what's returned is the number that's passed in plus one. So I think we should be okay to submit the final for that. And again, we've finished and we've got some more experience. And we'll just say this was very easy again. And let's have a look at the solutions. 
And some users have got some different approaches to this. For example, uh, this user's used the increment operator to actually increment the number before it's returned. Or for example, this user's actually used num plus equals to one. Uh, but you can see also we've got our arrow function, which is nice and clean and can be written on one line. Okay, so let's have a look at another challenge. So let's go on to the next one, which is the uh, area of a triangle. So this one's a little bit more complicated in that it's not just a case of adding one number or adding two numbers together. So we need to read the instructions a little bit, but you can see we've got a function that's taking two numbers and it's going to return a number back from it. And in the notes, it actually tells you how to actually work out the area of a triangle, which is really handy if you don't know how to do that. So it's basically going to be multiplying the two numbers together and then dividing them by two. So in our code, let's make a start on our function. So doing it step by step, let's first of all create a result variable that will hold the result. So all we do is multiply our base, which is our first argument, uh, and multiply that by the height, which is our second argument, and then we're going to divide the whole result by two. But just to be sure that we're dividing the result of base times height by two, we're actually going to wrap these in some parentheses so that we basically calculate this value first before we try and divide it by two, and it will just make it a little bit easier to read whilst also ensuring that we're actually making the division at the right point. So with that in place, we can then just return that result. And that seems to have done the trick. All of our tests have actually passed. And one thing to point out as well is if you're unsure what is actually being run with these tests, you can actually look in this test section here and you'll just see the values that are going to be passed into the actual function itself. And then this final value here on the right is the value that is being expected as the result. So for the first one, for example, the values passed in are three and two, and we're expecting the value to be three that's returned. And if we look in the console, that's exactly what this test here is looking for. Okay, so before we wrap this one up, let's refactor it. And again, I'm going to use an arrow function again to make it nice and tidy because we can put this all on one line. So for the try area function, uh, we're going to turn that into an arrow function. And we need to keep the parentheses this time because we've actually got two parameters this time, but we can actually move this intermediary result variable here because we don't actually really need that because when we can actually remove this return statement uh, to make it into a, an implicit return from our arrow function, and then we can just return the value like that. Let's check the tests are still passing. And there you go, we finished that particular challenge. Let's just say that was pretty easy too. And we'll have a look at the solutions again. And there you can see the first answer from another user was pretty much exactly the same as what we had in our solution. Okay, so we're going to do one final challenge before we wrap up. And it's the one at the bottom here, which is uh, just convert age to days. So let's click on that one. So this one is really simple. Again, it's just basically taking a number in as an argument and then just multiplying that by, well, in this case, 365, because uh, it's assuming there's 365 days in a year. So as the uh, notes say, we can actually ignore leap years, which is really good because we don't need to check for them. And we're only expecting positive numbers because you can't have a negative age for a person. So let's go over to our code. This time, I'm not going to actually write the function out uh, using the function keyword. Uh, I'm actually going to refactor it straight away into an arrow function. So uh, we're taking one variable in here, which is called age, and removing all of the curly braces. Hopefully all we should need to do for this one is to take our age value and multiply it by 365. So skipping out that first step, if we just click on check, and you can see all of our tests have passed first time. So we can just submit the final version of that. Now we've got our experience and we've notified that we've finished the challenge. And that one was again, very easy. So when you're ready to start working on some more complex edit challenges, you can see here, you can actually set your skill level to be a bit higher. So uh, we can go to the next challenge straight from here if we don't want to view other people's solutions. But let's say we want to look at some intermediate challenges. And you can see here now that this challenge is a lot more complicated than the ones we've just been looking at. Uh, so if we set at an intermediate level, we'll start getting uh, challenges like this come through. Uh, the other alternative you can do on the platform as well is when you're actually on the challenges homepage, you can actually just go up to this drop down here to actually customize the level of uh, challenges or the, the level of difficulty of the challenges that you're currently going to be completing. So for example, you could bump it straight up to easy if you're ready to go on something a little bit more complex. And there's plenty of challenges to go through here. You can see there's quite a few in this section already, uh, but then you can load additional ones at the bottom here too.
So there's no shortage of challenges to go through here to actually get you up to speed with your JavaScript functions. So that's just a bit of a brief overview of the Edibit platform and going through some challenges and how you might solve them at a very basic level. And hopefully if you are just starting out with JavaScript or you're actually just trying to improve your skills, then this offers loads of practice for you no matter what level you're at. And it's quite satisfying to go through those exercises and tick them off one by one. So I'll be doing another video going through some more complicated examples next time. So don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on that. And let me know in the comments below what you think about the Edibit platform. And if you found a particular exercise that you've enjoyed, feel free to share that in the comments as well. But that's it for this tutorial and I'll see you next time.